so more second corinthians i actually did an intro message but it turned into kind of a standalone rant that i may upload later um so we were talking about the bema seat and i hope you know if you have fears related to the bema seat i pray you will check out my um bema seat playlist i have a whole playlist of messages related to f addressing fears we have a total misunderstanding of the bema seat of what's being tested there of the nature of the judgment and it's not at all related to your sin or being buffeted for your faults it is about praising christ and christ in you for that which he wrought in you through the new testament ministry and what remains that the fire couldn't consume and everything that's wood hay and stubble is going to be burned off and never referenced again okay you're not going to be standing there shamed and in tears. You're going to be standing there in joy in the Lord's presence. And your whatever fruit you have is going to remain. And there's inward fruit that's only for the Lord. You know, your heart is a garden. And all the times he's brought you through weakness and comforted you. Where you've genuinely experienced something of Christ being wrought into you as comfort is remaining fruit. It's his fruit. Uh, he is exceedingly generous. And, you know, the, the scale of his generosity, we just can't understand. He chose for us to be co-heirs with him of his reward. And he is the only one who is worthy to take the book and open the seals. You know, John wept uh, at the throne because not one person in heaven or under heaven or under the earth or on the earth was worthy to open the seals then they said weep not for the lion of the tribe of judah the root and offspring of david has overcome and prevailed to open the seals he's worthy he's our worthiness he is the one who's worthy to receive the inheritance and yet he shares it with us because we are his joy and in fact we are his inheritance <laughs> so uh, and you know, I've always, I've done quite a lot, few messages in the course of my channel about clearing up last minute fears of the judgment seat that are causing people to hold back in their spiritual life from really running to Jesus. They think that there's something that has been left undone that is required of them and they've failed. And they're just kind of downcast and miserable about it. You know, when actually the exact opposite is true. Um, so anyway, we touched the Bema Seat. But the, his point here is not about the Bema Seat. Whenever Paul brings up the Bema Seat, it's not really about the Bema Seat. It's a side reference to where he uses as an opportunity to compare genuine ministry in the form of gold, silver, and precious stones, and the material it's constructed of, the New Testament ministry, with false ministry that doesn't build up but tears down, that isn't made of anything incorruptible, that doesn't produce a glory that lasts, that doesn't work Christ into the hearers, it doesn't produce epistles of Christ, it just produces sex and men's clubs, and I'm of Apollos, and I'm of Paul, like in 1 Corinthians 3, when he was talking about the judgment seat, he was addressing the fact that they were saying, I'm of Paul, and I'm of Cephas, and I'm of Apollos. He's like, no, all things are yours. The only thing that distinguishes us is one may water and one may plant, you know. But God is the one who gives the increase, and yes, we have our reward for our labor, but you are God's husbandry, and you are God's building. And we dare not damage you. Anybody who damages the temple of God, God will destroy, right? And he's saying, these false ministers are making spoil of you. Because they are not at all considering the judgment seat, or what God's building, or what God's farming. It, they don't care about you. They're feeding themselves. They're false shepherds. And here it's the same thing. In 2 Corinthians 5, he brings up the judgment seat again. But he's saying, look, do we need to commend ourselves to you? Uh, we just told you what the New Testament ministry is. 
Now I'm going to tell you that you need to once and for all renounce these false terrors, these false prophets and false ministers that are leading you astray, that are bringing you captive, seducing you from Christ, and bringing you into all the bondage that I had to write you about in the last letter. All that discipline. Your condition became deplorable because someone took the food out of your mouth and replaced it with straw. You couldn't even digest it, you know. Um, and it's because these people glory in appearance and not in heart. But And he's saying, we live in sight of the judgment seat of Christ. We know what we're building. We know what he's rewarding. And we long to go and receive that reward. But we want you to know that we speak in the sight of uh, God in Christ. We speak purely. We're not adulterating the word. Nor are we pretending. We're not using craftiness to stir you up. To seduce you to believe anything. We're telling you the plain truth. We're speaking plainly. Not cryptically. Not in code. Not for the secret elite. We are speaking God's wisdom in a mystery that's now been made known to the saints. We speak it very plainly. Right? And so, he says, the love of Christ constrains us because we... Wait, actually, back up. For we... He's Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest to God. So, you know, for those who are damaging God's building, there's terror. But we long to be with the Lord. We're not scared of the Lord. Nor should you be. Be reconciled to him. Okay. Um, and he says, I trust we are made manifest in your consciences. Your conscience is all important. Having a perfected conscience is what enables you to approve of that which is excellent. Like we talked about in Philippians. To recognize the New Testament ministry. To recognize God speaking and distinguish it from people who are manipulating and mishandling you and abusing you which he said in 1 Corinthians that those other apostles were doing. He said, you'll tolerate them if they slap you in the face. They lord it over you. They boast in their flesh, and they want you to crown them kings, you know, and worship them. Anyway, uh, he says, for we commend ourselves, we commend not ourselves again to you, but we give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that you may have something to answer them, which glory in appearance and not in heart. In other words, I'm telling you the inside scoop of what the New Testament ministry is. And that is a wisdom that no one can refute. Okay, these people glorying in their gifts and their appearance have no idea what we're doing here. They wouldn't understand a word of this. The natural man, he said in 1 Corinthians, receives not the things of the Spirit of God, their foolishness to him. Um, but he says... For whether we are beside ourselves, it is to God. And whether we're sober, it's for your sake. And what I get from that is that the false ministers who glory in appearance and not in heart make a big stink about their emotional state. In fact, they seduce through their emotions. They want you to believe that they're really kind and really spiritual and really love the Lord and really are something. And... You, you'll see that their ministry, they speak of themselves and how spiritual they are or how much they're serving the Lord or how much they are praising the Lord. They make a big show about their spirituality. Okay, That's called being beside yourself. And Paul's saying, look, we live in the presence of the Lord and we know the terror and the awesome majesty of the Lord. I was caught up to the third heaven, he says in 1 Corinthians, right? Uh... I've seen things that I'm not even allowed to utter. But the love of Christ constrains us, and we are sober for your sake. And so Paul is telling them, look, part of the problem in 1 Corinthians, I think it's in 1 Corinthians, maybe it'll be in this one, where they said his weighty, his letters are weighty, but his bodily presence is weak and contemptible. Compared to these people who glory in appearance, he doesn't seem very spiritual at all. And it's because Paul just talked matter-of-factly about the kingdom. He just talked about the truth. He did not rely on himself as the source of any power, nor did he try to present himself as the source of power. His faith was entirely in the fact that the word 
which is the truth, is what's working because it's Christ. And the excellency has to be, the excellency of the power has to be of God and not of man. So he presented truth to them in plainness of speech, which they misinterpreted as not being spiritual. And that's the problem we have in charismatic Christianity or Christianity in general today. People heap up teachers after their lusts because they're sensual. And they say, well, that guy has a really nice tone of voice and he seems very spiritual. And every time he talks, I feel like I, all is okay. And it doesn't matter that he's, I'm not learning anything about the Bible. I'll just listen to him. <laughs> you know, the YouTube ministries, the church, the institutional church ministries are built entirely on sensuality and appearance, but not reality. You know, Paul, when he went to, uh, he was in one place, I think it was in Thessalonica, he talked about the kingdom for three hours and Dorcas fell asleep. He fell out the window and died. Paul went and raised him from the dead and brought him back upstairs and kept talking about the kingdom. You know, he gave lectures that seemed academic, but they were focused on the truth and focused on Christ and him crucified, right? All these things we've been talking about. And I've had people say on my channel, you know, I used to listen to you for a little bit, but you were off-putting because you didn't, you didn't flatter me the way the others do. You didn't have very much emotion in your voice. And it seemed kind of academic and boring. But for some reason, I kept listening. And now my life has changed. Why? Because I'm just plainly speaking the truth. I'm not manipulating. I'm not uh, cunningly... Uh, presenting myself as more spiritual than I am or more caring than I am. No, I tell you exactly who I am, but I tell you what I believe from the Word, and I show it to you in the Word. That's all Paul was doing, and yet the Word is the power, okay? The excellence of the power is of God and not a man. So he says, um, for whether we're beside ourselves, it's to God. You know, yeah, we can be ecstatic in a spiritual state before God, knowing how awesome he is. But we're not whooping up a storm here. When we're with you, we're sober for your sake. Or whether we're sober, it's for your cause. For the love of Christ constrains us because we just judge that if one died for all, then all were dead. So my natural man is dead. So there's no reason to puff him up and make him look good. He's supposed to be in the tomb. You're not even supposed to see him. Christ is the one you're supposed to see. He's the one who's risen. And he died for all that they should live henceforth, not unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. We live unto him. And if you live unto him, you're going to have a clear conscience and you're not going to be manipulating people. You're going to let the Lord do it. Not manipulate them, but feed them, you know. Uh... Therefore, he says, henceforth, for now on, we know no man according to the flesh. No man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth we know him no more. Well, how do we know him? Well, we know him according to the New Testament ministry. We know him as the glory that's being wrought into us. We know us in, as Christ in us, the hope of glory. We know us as these shining letters that it's being written into our hearts by the Spirit of the living God. Yes, he is the man on the throne, but he's the river flowing out of the throne, and he's the fountain in our spirit. And he is drinkable and eatable and breathable, and he's our Christ to be our life. That's so much more than the, just the man Jesus. All of these things were contained in Jesus Christ in seed form. But until that seed was planted into the earth and died, it abided alone. But when it died and sprung up in resurrection, now he is impartable. And he's gotten into us, and we are his harvest and resurrection. So that's what it means to know him in the spirit. We acknowledge him not based on an experience, but based on what the word says he is. We are established, I think it's John, or maybe it's Peter. He says, I'm glad to see you established in the present truth. The present truth is the revelation of Christ after he ascended to the heavens and revealed the mystery to Paul. 
the mystery of Christ in you, the hope of glory, right? The New Testament, which became the New Testament ministry stewardship. Uh, that's how we know him. We believe the testimony of Scripture concerning the Son, God's testimony concerning his Son from start to finish. Not just the man Jesus that incarnated and died and rose and ascended, but also the glorified Christ who is the life of the body and who is the head of the body and who is the chief cornerstone in whom the body is being fitly framed together and growing into a temple in the Lord and in whom we are being built together to be a habitation of God in spirit. That's all spiritual truth that is mystical in, ex in an ex a certain way, but it's plainly revealed in the scriptures. And all we're doing is believing this beautiful language that describes what Christ has become to us and what we've become because of him. Okay, So when we say, if any man is in Christ, or we no, no, no longer know each other after the flesh, we used to know Christ after the flesh, we have to, when we know Christ and we know each other, we have to acknowledge a body of truth. Okay? So when you know the saints, you don't know them as mere men. You know what the gospel says about them. They have a shepherd. They have the eternal life. They are covered by the blood. They are sanctified. They have a high priest. They are regenerated. They're a new creature in Christ. The old things have passed away. God is not holding their sins against them. Jesus is their advocate. He's their propitiation, right? They are heirs together with the grace of life. They are uh, not in bondage to come up with anything in themselves to fulfill the law. They're free in Christ and they're heirs. Do you know the brethren that way? When I look at you in the flesh, no, I don't. But when I look at the word, I have to say, I have to begin to let that truth regulate how I treat you. And these false ministers don't. They take the way of Cain. They don't even want to tell you you're saved because then that gets you out from under their power. They want you to keep coming to them for your spirituality. That's why they want you to not believe you're saved is because they want you to keep coming to them. Well, let me teach you how it's really done. Just keep coming to me, you know. When you know you're complete in Christ, then you know you don't need them anymore. Now they're just fellow heirs and, and brothers with you to enjoy the portion together. They can't rule over you anymore. See, when we get a vision of who we are in Christ, we are spontaneously free from the carrots and the sticks that men in religion use to bait us and manipulate us. We don't care anymore. You can't do that to me anymore. I'm complete in Christ. I lack nothing. And you're not bringing me Christ. So we really don't have anything to fellowship about. I don't need you. Talk to you later. <laughs> you get free. It seems, and then they'll tell you you're rebellious and disrespectful and not submitting to your elders and blah, blah, blah. But they're just having a pity party because you won't celebrate them the way they have invested uh, in themselves to be celebrated. <laughs> But uh, the point is, when you understand who you are in Christ, that's the key to being free. And also, you need to extend that to others. So we used to know Christ according to the flesh. He was the man, Jesus. Yeah, he died for my sins. But now I understand he's in me. And he is the reality of the body of Christ. And if you're in Christ and I'm in Christ, then we are co-heirs. Neither of us has uh, authority to rule it over the other. Neither of us is more complete than the other. All we can do is try to enjoy the fellowship together. And Jesus said, he who doesn't uh, gather with me scatters. So we don't want to scatter. We don't want to bring something other than Christ to the table to introduce a foreign taste to drive people away from the table, which is what the false masters do. They're driving people away from the table. <laughs> um, anyway... Henceforth, okay, so he says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Now, that's a new creation. We are all new creatures, but we're part of the new creation, which is called the new man, which is Christ as the head and the church as the body, all one organic entity, the habitation of God, the mystery of Christ, the masterpiece of God. This is the new creation. 
it's a new humanity produced in resurrection and it's a corporate man okay now that is true of us in our spirit the calvinists use this verse to say that when you get born again all the old desires for sin are gone and you have this new holy fervor for god and if you don't then you aren't genuinely born again that's because they are looking for evidences of the new creation in the wrong place the out they're looking in the outward man they're looking in the vessel no the new creation is the fact that the empty vessel got a treasure you were just a vessel now you are a vessel containing a treasure and that treasure is christ himself and he dwells as life in your spirit and yes if you learn to let god deal with you and get glimpses of christ he will express himself through you okay but the expression is secondary the reality of the new creation is something we don't see See, the Calvinists want to look at things. The fruit inspectors say, no, I need to see something. But Paul says, no, we look to those things which are not seen. Okay? Our whole ministry is based on things you can't see. You have to believe that this is who Christ is. And if you believe that testimony of what he accomplished in his death and resurrection, then you'll also begin to see who you are in Christ. And you'll see all these wonderful things he's doing that you had no idea of that I just described in the last three chapters where he was talking about the New Testament ministry. We had no idea all that was going on in us. How do we know it is? By faith. We just believe Paul's word. All we're doing is believing the Bible. Okay? So the new creation is a reality, but it's an unseen reality, hidden in an earthen vessel. And because the earthen vessel doesn't change sufficiently, some people will say, well, you're not a new creation. No, the earthen vessel is going to be thrown away. It's going to be dissolved. And yes, there's a new reality in me that Christ is in me. And if you feed me with Christ, I'll grow in him and learn to take him as everything and resort to him. And you will see something come out of me, but it won't be what you're looking for because you're looking for glory in the outward realm. You're looking for Sinai. But this spirituality, the, the reality, produces a meekness. It produces a tenderness. It produces even a weakness in Christ, where I'm not boasting of myself, but my confidence is entirely in Christ. I'm not even looking at myself anymore. That's not what religious people like to see. Religious like to see, religious people like to see self-conscious people who are focused on their performance and measuring their performance against other people's performance and ranking them as to who's the who's the leader and they're hoping to be the head of that pack okay but when we see that our sufficiency is only from christ and we have no sufficiency in ourselves we lose all that we have no desire to rank ourselves we already know we come in last but we know that the last shall be first. We'll, we're happy to be Mephibosheb, lame, incapable, weak, and poor. And yet David comes and seats us up at the king's table and arrays us in his finest outfit and gives us the feast and tells people, leave him alone. He's an heir because of the covenant. He loves doing that. That's our Jesus. It's because of Jesus that we are at the table, not because of us. And religious people cannot handle that. They just can't handle it. They want to merit. They want to work. They want glory. They want a glory in appearance and not in heart. Okay. Okay, I've labored that point. All things are become new. And it is true. When you were regenerated, a whole new life came into you. Okay. Which was Christ himself, the eternal life. And that life is now in the earthen vessel. And sometimes it shines out. Okay. But again, these are things we acknowledge, not because we see something with our senses, but because we believe what the New Testament ministry tells us about Christ. We used to know Christ in one way, but now we know him after the Spirit because the New Testament ministry, because we simply believe God's word, all of it. And the same is true of the heirs with Christ. We know that there's a treasure in the earthen vessels. We know that they're nothing. And yet, 
God has chosen them to be something, and he's put something in them, which is Christ. All right. Okay. Uh, so then he says, and all things are of God, who has made, reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. So even though he mentioned the judgment seat, there's no hint of judgment here. This is a reconciliation ministry, and God's already reconciled you. You know, the, for a long time, my favorite verse was in Romans 5. Therefore, uh, we, having been justified by faith in his blood, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And I would pray, Lord, I thank you that you established peace with God for me. Because I used to always feel condemned. And I would pray that. And I would just look away from myself to the blood and say, the only thing that secures peace with God is the blood of Christ. Not my disposition, not my feelings, not my emotions. Um, I had all kinds of anxiety issues. And I was really angry. I was in this really bad situation. And I would have these outbursts towards God. And they were temptations. And I was, on the one hand, the enemy was tempting me. But on the other hand, my flesh was tempting it's like I was tempting God to throw me off to see, because I was adopted, so I wanted to know if I could test God and trust Him. That's a very adult, uh, baby, babyish thing to do. Two-year-olds do that. They start testing limits. So I would test limits with God to see how far could I go, or is He going to throw me off and abandon me like everybody else? You know? And uh, and I would get into these rages. Now, this is like years ago, um, but the Romans 5 the way I would settle down is acknowledge you know therefore having been justified by faith in his blood we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ and we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and I would see myself standing in grace before the Lord at peace with him knowing that it wasn't up to me to make the peace he already made it and that's what he's saying here you can't wreck this thing. God already reconciled you. Okay. Um, and he said, to, with this ministry of reconciliation is that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now that reconciliation is in Christ. Outside of Christ, the law still stands. Okay. But in Christ... He blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that was contrary to us. He stripped off the principalities. He took away the condemnation. He crucified us. He took away our sins. And now the ministry of reconciliation puts us in Christ. That's where God is. God is in Christ. Everything that's in Christ is going to survive the fire and go into the next age in joy. Everything outside of Christ is going to be destroyed. And God's purpose is to head up all things in Christ, in the heavens and in the earth. So we need to be in Christ. And so the ministry of reconciliation is how God put us in Christ. When we believed him, we were baptized into him. And we're there now. We're secure. We've been reconciled. We have peace with God. No matter how we feel in our outward vessel, the new creation is at total peace with God. Okay? You've got to realize that the flesh and the spirit are at war, and the flesh hasn't changed. The new creation is not something in your flesh, it's in the spirit. It's not something seen, it's unseen. And the new creation is only known through the word of Christ, through the New Testament ministry. you got to learn who that new creation is. Not by experiencing it, but by believing it. Believing what the word says about who you are in Christ and who he is in you. And he says, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech us, you by us, we pray, you in Christ's steed... Instead, be reconciled to God. For he who has made him sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. There's so much in that verse, obviously, uh, that I can't touch on it here. <laughs> I had to come back to it in the next message, I guess. But the point is, he's asking Corinth to be reconciled to him. And it's because their conscience, even though they were reconciled, and they're in Christ as believers. Their conscience has been totally defiled through everything they've been through. Plus, they've been eating bad food from the false ministers. 
and they haven't been digesting the New Testament ministry. In fact, they began to believe the slanderous reports about the apostles. So now they need to be reconciled. So even though we are at peace with God, if our mind is not at peace with him, we still need to be reconciled. And so there is a process in the Christian life of taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, casting down vain imaginations and every lofty thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, right? And taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ is called renewing the mind. The mind is where the enemy has all planted all the bad concepts that keep you alienated from who you really are in Christ and enjoying your inheritance. And so in that sense, we do need to be reconciled. But our reconciliation is to see that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing the trespass against them. And the Corinthians need to know that they're forgiven, that God's not expecting anything from them, that they have peace with God in Christ, and now they need to be reconciled to that fact that's been established in Christ. Okay, that's what he's asking them to do, is just to believe the word of what Christ accomplished. That's the main thing. That's the only thing we have to do, is to believe the unseen things that God spoke to us about in the word. All right, take care.